Let's stand together. You can open your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 24. Children may be dismissed to Children's Church, Junior Church out this way, first through sixth grade, fours and fives out the back door, four and five-year-olds, that is, out of the back door. And we'll begin reading in verse 24. In verse 24, by the way, if you're wondering what that picture is, that's Nebuchadnezzar sleeping. That's who that is. Uh, but, and we're going to stay on this slide for quite a while before we actually get into my outline, so just relax. It isn't like I forgot. All right, Daniel chapter 2, beginning verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy all the, uh, the wise men of Babylon. He went and said unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste, hurriedly, fast, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show to you, king show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, your dream and all the visions upon, of your head upon your bed are these. As for you, O king, your thoughts came into your mind upon your bed, what should come to pass hereafter, and he that reveals secrets makes known to you what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. I'm nothing special. But for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that you might know the thoughts of of your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless your word as it's preached. Lord, I pray that you help us to understand the truth that is here. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to learn and determine to stand wisely, boldly, kindly, lovingly for you in an evil world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For years, Daniel... As a, I mean, his, his teenage years were chaotic. I was thinking about these young people, uh, young people that are in college today, the young people that are graduating from high school today, in college today. These are the, this is the, the COVID generation. Um, they, they have lived through chaotic times. Uh, the, the only real comparison, I mean, we have the, the generation that was the 9-11 generation, you know, while they were in, in high school, they, 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 there was that generation, there is this COVID generation, there was that generation that lived the latter part of the 1960s. We had that 1968 election in which you had, um, assass you know, the 1960s with the assassination of JFK and RFK and um, Martin Luther King and, you know, all the chaos that was going on at the time. And some of you are old enough to remember all of that was going on during those times. Um, those were chaotic times, and to be a teenager during those times could be pretty traumatic. I grew up in a world, I don't know some of you, <laughs> you grew up in a world where they'd sh you know, go into class and they'd show you, a, I, I remember this in a public school, you know, show you a video of what the world would be like with thermonuclear war. They showed that to sixth graders. All the kids walk out of class with eyes like this. Now, there were some of you that were the previous generation where they taught you to hide under your desk like that was going to do anything. <laughs> but so it was for Daniel. Daniel lived in this chaotic time. In fact, Daniel as a teenager is living through the siege of Jerusalem. It would have been, I was trying to think about something in modern times. 
going to move this out of my way. Um, I was trying to think about something in modern times that might have been seemingly familiar. Maybe if you're a young person, a teenager growing up in London in World War II, where every night the bombers are coming. And every night you have to go to the bomb shelters to sleep. And you don't know in the next morning who's going to be living and who's going to die. And you are constantly, I mean, we look at this historically based upon what actually happened, but you were living through the time. You, weren't, you were always wondering when they're going to hit the beaches and when you're going to have to learn German. And Daniel was growing up in Jerusalem in a time like that, no doubt. Daniel was living in Jerusalem during the siege of Jerusalem. And then they came, the time came where Jerusalem finally fell. And so there are, and there are, when, when a city like that falls and you have a conquering nation like the Babylonians, the, one of the first things that happens is mass executions. And Daniel would have watched as friends, people he knew, relatives, were executed before the, the swords of the Babylonians. But then there's this group, and Daniel's among them. And, and they're being taken, and they're going to be set aside. And I can imagine he and his friends are being set aside, and they're asking one another, well, what, is, what is this about? What are we going to do? What's, what's happening with us? What's so special about us? Are we being set aside for greater torture? Are we being set aside for execution? And they began to gather all their, uh, their belongings. And as the Babylonians start to make their way back to Babylon, here is Daniel and his friends and a, a group by probably among the thousands that are being marched from Jerusalem all the way back to Babylon. They don't know what they're going to do there. Are we going to be marched in as prizes of war? They probably were. Are we going to become slaves? Well, there was a sense in which they were slaves. And then, of course, they're being marched back to Babylon with all of the treasures of the temple. Now, this so now Daniel is, is entering into a world that he had never experienced before. You see, he had lived in Israel. He'd grown up with certain dietary laws and a certain way of dressing and a certain way of worshiping and, you know, worshiping in the temple and a, a certain way of living in the, the Old Testament law. And all of that was all that he knew all of his life. And now all of it was gone. The city was his city, the city of David. It was gone. His, and this is the foundation of his faith. His nation is gone. All the, the temple is destroyed. All the vessels of the temple are being taken away to Jerusalem. There would be a sense in which his nation no longer exists at all. So what do you do then? It's a long walk from Jerusalem to Babylon. They would have camped at night as they made their way 15, 20, 30 miles at a time every day. Set up camp every night like the old pioneers did as they were going on the Oregon Trail from the east to the west. You know, they'd set up camp every night. And as they set up camp here, these Jewish captives gathering around the fire, and certainly they're having conversations about the things that they saw. Do you know what happened to your father? Do you know what happened to your grandfather? I don't know. Did you see the temple? Yes, we saw. Well, it was probably not destroyed quite yet. That would have happened in 586 B.C., so it would have been coming. What are we going to do? How are we going to live? So the question for them was this. Are we going to go into survival mode and simply adapt to the circumstances around us? Which, folks, that's human instinct. Human instinct is to adapt. Find a way to live. Accept the names of the Babylonians that they give you. After all, they took their names, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Daniel, became Shadrach, Meshach, Bednego, 
Abednego and Belteshazzar, which, by the way, are names, these were, their Hebrew names were named after their God, the God of Israel, and their Babylonian names were the names of the gods of the Babylonians. So they're starting to go through this brainwashing process, even in renaming them, because a name had a lot to do with what you believed and who you are, what people believed about you. And so renaming you was a, was a big part of the whole process of reprogramming their minds. And so as they're having these conversations beside the fire on their way from Jerusalem to Babylon, there comes, there, there comes a resolution, at least with these four. And maybe they didn't have much chance to fellowship or to talk with or to speak with much larger group. We just don't know. I'm just imagining how it must have been, how it had to have been. And the, there were things, you know, the, because they're coming out of their known world, they're trying to figure out, well, what can we do? Be because, because this is what's in Daniel's mind. It isn't, in Daniel's mind is not how can we please the Babylonians or how can I please Nebuchadnezzar. What's in Daniel's mind is how can I please God in the circumstance in which I live. And so they have to make decisions. Well, do we accept the names? They can call us whatever they want to call us. We'll answer to the names that they call us. But it came down to, can we eat the king's food? And Daniel, it says in chapter 1, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. In other words, Daniel made a specific choice. Instead of living in survival mode, he made this choice to live in I'll obey God at all costs mode. Now, that required wisdom because it, it required wisdom to know what was something that was okay before God and what was not okay before God. Now, do you understand there are many of you, in fact, most of you, you're living in the world with the same choices right now. And you're trying to make the difference. You're trying to make the choice between what, am I going to live in survival mode or am I going to live in please God mode? And, and sometimes it's, you think, well, just survival mode is just the thing that you have to do. No, there is a please God mode and we live it by faith. And sometimes that comes at great sacrifice. So, of course, he gets, to Jerusalem, he gets to Babylon. And when he gets to Babylon, they're going to get them ready. Uh, they're getting them prepared to serve the king. And they take the smartest and the brightest. And they're putting new clothes upon them. And they've, given them, they've already given them new na names. They're converting them to be Babylonians. And, of course, this was, a, this was pretty smart. After all, when one nation conquered another, they would take the spoils of that nation and they would use the spoils of that nation to enrich the nation. That's why they're taking all the vessels of the temple in Jerusalem. But they also understood, the ancients did, that brains and skills and ability, those were the spoils of a nation too. The human, the, the, these are human resources. These are smart people, and if you can take these people and you can incorporate them into your society, your society is much better, much more affected, and you can, you can, they're seeing things from a different perspective, and they allow you, this allows you to rule a broader range. And so this is, this is, the, this, this is the intellect of the Babylonians, and it's a pretty smart thing. And so they bring all of that, all the wealth of Babylon. And as they get there, they're getting prepared Daniel has already purposed in his heart he won't deny, defile himself with king's meat, and he does. And he takes the stand. And God, we saw this last week, God providentially works blessing them because there was this experiment. You know, you eat the vegetables and you can eat all the, the meat and the protein and all of the best things that they have for the Babylonians. And at the end, and remember, folks, remember this isn't a Bible affirmation of a vegetarian diet, Okay. This was considered miraculous. And at the end, they were able to live and, and prosper 
And so uh, my assumption is that when, this, when all of this was over, when all of this was over, they got the chance to determine their own diet because Daniel was now placed in a position of authority. And so they didn't have to eat just the vegetables, but they, ought, they got to eat what would have been a, a typical kosher diet in a foreign land. Probably, I can see Daniel, he's being raised to a position of authority. He's now able to hire a, a, a Jewish chef or a Jewish cook or somebody else to come and to work for him. So these people come and work for him. And now they're providing a, a kosher diet for them. And, and everything seems to be going okay. And now they're being raised to a position of authority. And they're given new clothes to wear. And things seem to be going well. And they are respected. And everything's seems to be all right, and wow, everything's good with the world now. We never dreamed that we could have it so good in Babylon. No, bad things are bad going all the way back in Jerusalem, but praise God, he is preserving us here. Everything is okay. And then the king has a dream. And we saw last week, the king has a dream, and he has all these wise men but he knows there's something different about this dream. There's something significant about this. There was something about what he saw that he knew this thing mattered. This, there was something about this that is supernatural. And he's heard it before. I'm sure he had dreams before, and he calls the wise men, and they say, well, this means that, and this means that. You're a great king. And, and you know, they're telling him all the things that he wanted and wants to hear, because that's typically what the wise men and astrologers and, and people do. They talk, you know, this means that you're great, and you're wonderful, and everything's... He said, no, I need to know the truth here. And so he comes up with a plan. If you're going to tell me what the dream means... I want you to tell me what the dream is first. And they said, that's impossible. Can't possibly do that. And of course, Daniel wasn't in that group. So then he gives out the decree that all the... Because, because Nebuchadnezzar's, he's not a man to do anything by halves, Right? It's, I mean, it's an all or nothing thing. And so since a few of the wise men couldn't show the interpretation of the dream or couldn't tell him what the dream was, he sends out the decree, we're going to kill them all. And so now the decree goes out to kill them all. And Arioch, who's working specifically with Daniel, who's the captain of the guard, comes to Daniel and says, well, you need to get your things in order because you're going to be executed next week. What? Or maybe he's going to be executed today. That was, it was more of an urgency. Please go in and ask the king for more time. Then Daniel goes and speaks to his friends, and they fast, and they pray, and they fast and they pray. And uh, where, in that moment, what kind of deliverance would you expect? See, you know, there comes to those, those moments in life, and maybe there are some of you that are in one of those moments in life right now, in which you're, you're in this moment where you just, you are in a pickle, I mean, you are in such a difficult circumstance that you, you don't even know how God is going to fix this. How, how is he going to, how, how can he, I, I don't even know. That, see, we, off, we get in some circumstances in life where we know exactly what we think God should do to fix it. And so, you know, we'll pray and we'll say, well, let's pray that the king will relent because that's what we would have prayed for. Right? If you were in that moment, what if you, you asked him to do? Well, then the king will relent, that he'll change his mind, that he won't kill all the wise men of Babylon. Maybe that we won't be considered among the wise men of the Babylon, that somehow God will preserve his people. I doubt many of you would have prayed that God would tell you what the dream was. But that's what Daniel did. They prayed, and God gave him the dream told them exactly what the dream was. Now, and God answered that prayer. In fact, so much so that Daniel was absolutely, he didn't go in before the king and say, did you dream about an image? And maybe, you know, have you ever seen those guys that, you know, the, the so-supposed psychics 
You know, they're making things up as they go. Did you dream this and did you do that and maybe this and so. Now he didn't. He didn't. He didn't throw out these leading questions and watch the responses. He said, "This is what you dreamed, and the God of heaven has revealed it to me." And that's where we come at this moment. Now, how is it that Daniel? How is it that Daniel could have such confidence that this dream that he has in his head is is exactly what God, exactly what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed? And that's because he has great confidence in his God. Daniel's view of God is much different than the average Christian's view of God. And this is important for us to understand because if you're going to stand for God in a wicked world, you have to understand, you have to have a strong trust in a very accurate understanding of who God is. He's the God who knows. Coming back from, Bab- from Jerusalem to Babylon, they brought all the treasures of the kingdom. And I don't know how they got back. I don't know if these things that I'm talking, going to talk to you about in a moment got back with the treasures. But what is very clear, as we see later on in Daniel's life, is that there were copies of the Old Testament scriptures that made their way from Jerusalem to Babylon as well. That's not something normally slave owners would let slave, slaves bring. And it wasn't just the Pentateuch, and it just wasn't just the Psalms, and it wasn't just the books of history. In fact, the writings not only of the old prophets, at least from Daniel's perspective, but also the contemporary prophets were also among the writings. For instance, the writings of Isaiah in which God told Isaiah, written around the early 700s B.C., so about 100 years, 150 years, maybe 200 years prior to when Daniel lived, Isaiah told Hezekiah, you showed all the vessels of the temple to the Babylonians, they will be carried into Babylon. Daniel knew about that prophecy. He is now watching the fulfillment of the prophecy. The fact is that when God keeps his word, even when it's a negative promise, is still evidence that there's a God who keeps his word. And so you have certainly among those those writings that are taken from Jerusalem and Babylon, the writings of Isaiah. But we'll find out later on, Daniel also studied the prophecies of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel. That means he lived at the same time. In fact, Jeremiah was not just a contemporary prophet, he was a very unpopular prophet. But you do know what Jeremiah said? Jeremiah said, God's sending the Babylonians. Don't fight them. Don't align with Egypt. They fought them. They aligned with Egypt. God's going to take you into captivity. God's going to prosper you in captivity. Those were the promises of Jeremiah. And now Daniel, as he studies these prophecies, sees them coming to pass. Because there's a God who knows See, and and here's what he knows. He knows the past in perfect detail. He knew what was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, not just because he knows all things, but he's the one that caused Nebuchadnezzar to dream the dream. Have you ever noticed how people seem to forget the past or alter the past? I had a friend who was writing a memoir of his life. None of you know him. And there's some stories he tells about, you know, his testimony and memoirs in, in his life. And it's like he's been telling those stories over the years and they've been getting a little bit different every time. And I, I remember being there. And it didn't happen exactly that way. I'm sure he's convinced it happened that way, but it didn't happen that way, unless I'm wrong. 
That could be. But isn't it interesting how we... The thing is, what he remembers and what I remember are two different things. Because we don't even remember the past perfectly. There is a good chance that a number of things that you were taught in history class, sorry, Justin, weren't true. It's just that's how it got wrote down, written down, and now everybody believes it, and that's the way it's affirmed. And of course, people try to undo the facts of history, but sometimes the undoing of the facts of the history are truly undoing the true facts of history. We just don't know for sure everything that happened. That's why it's important to document and document accurately. But God knows all of the past. You see, here's the God of, the God of heaven knows every little detail of everything that you've ever done. Not only that, he knows every detail of everything you've ever thought. Well, let's take that. He knows every detail of everything you would have done had you had opportunity to do it. You say, that's a little scary. It should be. It should then amaze you that he loves you enough to send his son to die on a cross for you. He knows the past perfectly. He knows the present perfectly. There are much... Right now, we live in a country, everybody's trying to figure out, how did this happen? How did this shooter get up on the roof and what happened and all of that? I, you know, here's what I am convinced. None of us will ex ever exactly know for sure every detail. But I tell you this, God knows going to court and one of the things that a judge and a jury have to do is discern who's telling the truth and who's lying and who did what. And they have to listen to all the evidence and put all of that together and you know, make a judgment based upon what they think happened. And um, did you know that sometimes they get it wrong? Have you ever had two people standing in front of you, lying both and not knowing for sure which one is telling the truth? Every teacher has had that. Every parent has had that. Two little kids, you know, five-year-old and four-year-old, and they're telling you, yeah, yeah, you know. God knows the present perfectly, completely. Everything about the present, every detail and context. These are the things about the present. But he knows things about the present that are only known to him. He knows the things that are going on that no one else sees. He knows the future. In fact, Daniel says... We're coming to make known to you the things that will, what shall be happen in the latter days as he interprets this vision. He knows the future. In fact, so Daniel comes in before the king and he says, I, give me time. He goes, he, gets the, he gets the dream, but he not only gets the dream, he gets the interpretation thereof. And so Daniel comes in, verse 31. Let's start, start here. It says, Thou, O king, saw a great image whose brightness was excellent. And he stood before you. you the form was, it was a terrible image, great big image. By the way, we're going to get to Daniel chapter 3 about by, bowing down to the image. I tend to think that the image that, that Nebuchadnezzar made in, in chapter 3 looked like the image that he dreamed about in chapter 2. We'll get that later. <clears throat> the head was fine gold, breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron and part clay. You saw till a stone cut without hands smote the image, it hit the feet of the image that were of iron and clay, and it all broke into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the blast, the silver, the, the gold, all of, all of it broke into pieces as if it was just vaporized and flew into the air and filled the whole earth. That's the image that you saw. This is the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation thereof. King, you're a king of kings. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom. Now, isn't it a, Nebuchadnezzar, you're a king of kings. You're great and you're powerful. But let me remind you something. God gave you this kingdom. Power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, 
the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, fowls of the heaven, he that gives unto you, unto your hand, he made you ruler over all. You have this great kingdom, but God gave it to you. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. I have a hunch that Nebuchadnezzar already knew that. My guess is, it doesn't say it in the Bible, this is totally my speculation, that the face looked like Nebuchadnezzar's. Who knows, I could be wrong. After you will arise another kingdom inferior to you, another and a third kingdom of brass. So there's going to be another kingdom. Uh, and so there's a kingdom of brass and that w- which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all the kings and all the iron breaks all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. It'll be a loose kingdom, loosely fitting together. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part with clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. It's loose. It doesn't hold together, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in those days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. By the way, that's the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is an eternal kingdom, not just a thousand years. For as much as you saw that stone cut without hands, the mountain without hands, and it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to you, king, what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Now we can go back historically and see the fulfillment of this. The Babylonians were the head of gold. The Babylonians ruled from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. In Daniel's life, the kingdom of Babylon would fall to the Medes and the Persians. The Medes of the Persians, and it's the, the whole story of it is described in Daniel chapter 5 when they come into the city of Babylon and they take it over. And so we have the Medo-Persian, the silver kingdom, which follows that from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. Of course, in 331 B.C., spreading over all of the earth is the kingdom of the Greeks. That is the Bronze Kingdom. By the way, that's one that spread over the whole known world of its day as Alexander the Great, like, like a whirlwind took over the world, coming, west, coming east from Greece and then south through, through the, uh, the Middle East into Egypt, then, then east even, even further into Iraq and Iran, and as far as what we know today as India spreading over the whole world in a short period of time. The Bible says, or excuse me, Jewish historians say that when, when the Alexander the Great came through Israel and thought to sack Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders went out to meet him and brought copies of the book of Daniel and showed him his own kingdom in prophecy from 200 years before. And it's the reason that, that, that Alexander the Great spared Jerusalem. Then, of course, the Iron Kingdom, starting in 146, as the, the, <coughs> the Romans overtook the Greeks, 146 to 476 A.D., but you can all go all the way to 1400, and we'll talk about that, as the Roman Kingdom. The Roman Kingdom existed in strength, Later on, it split between the eastern and the western. And then you have all the armies of, or all the kingdoms of Europe being sort of fractured pieces of the Roman kingdom. So you have the Roman kingdom with the legs of iron, but then you have the, the iron and the feet mixed with clay. Folks, and that vestiges of the Roman kingdom exist even unto this day in what we understand to be NATO and the European Union and all of all the armies and all of the kingdoms of Europe and Asia. You say, what was the, what was the leader of Rome called? Well, he was called Caesar. Do you know what the, you know what the Russian word for Caesar is? Kaiser. You have 
You have the existence of these, this iron mixed with clay that exists till this day. And folks, God gave to Nebuchadnezzar in that moment a blueprint from his point till when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. Because he knows the past. In fact, and Daniel says, this is sure. This is going to happen, folks. According to the testimony of Daniel in the Old Testament, the reign of Jesus coming in the future is sure. It's going to happen. God not only knows. I was wondering if I would have a, enough to preach this morning. There's a God in heaven that reveals. He reveals to people, to individuals. It isn't like he has all of this knowledge and it's all wrapped up in his own brain and he doesn't reveal things to us. In fact, look what he revealed to Daniel. God showed Daniel what the dream was and God showed Daniel what it would be. But not just Daniel, God showed Nebuchadnezzar. For whatever purposes God had, he reveals to a pagan king the kingdoms that will come. You say, well, why doesn't God show me the things that I want him to show me in my life? Do you realize how much he has revealed to you right here? You have more revelation from God in the pages of this book than Daniel had. He's the God who reveals. He reveals to people, to individuals. He reveals his glory. And in this book, he draws people to himself. By the way, in the circumstances of life too. He's the God who reveals. We talked about the image, the gold, Babylon, the silver, Medo-Persians, the bronze, Greece, the iron, Rome, 146 to 476, the mixed iron, the loose remnants. He's the God who reveals. He's not just the God who reveals, though. He's the God who rules. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Verse 44, And in the, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. It's the fifth or the sixth kingdom. Depending how you're looking at the image, the image is the first one is the gold, the second one is the silver. The third is the belly and, thigh, belly and thighs of brass. The fourth is the legs of iron. The, fix, the, the fifth is the iron mixed with clay. The sixth kingdom is the eternal kingdom, the stone cut without hands. By the way, the stone cut without hands hits the feet. And in the imagery that is described here, the entire image vaporizes. You say, well, why does it do that? Well, that's because each kingdom succeedingly takes over the other. So each one is represented anew in the previous one. But the previous one is represented anew in the new one. So that final kingdom is the sum total of all the kingdoms. He's the God who rules. He's the God who is going to bring it to pass. So here, here's the issue. And it's just so important for us to understand the response for, Nathan, for, for Daniel was to worship God. But it turns to God. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the path for Nebuchadnezzar. It turned, but, it turns, um, but it turns to God, elevation of God's people. Um, yes, it, tur it should turn people to God. Take a look here at verse 36. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshiped Daniel. You understand, he is the most powerful, most obnoxious, most arrogant man in the world. I don't know if you might be able to think of somebody that's kind of like that. Imagine falling on, their, on his face before someone else and humbling himself. You say, well, he's not supposed to worship Daniel. Well, no, he's not supposed to worship Daniel, but that worship has turned very quickly because he said he commanded that they should offer oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered and said unto Daniel, of a truth, here's the real direction of the worship, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing you could reveal this secret. 
He turns to worship Daniel, but that worship turns to God. It ends up with an elevation of God's people. And by the way, this is a path that Nebuchadnezzar is on. You say, well, did Nebuchadnezzar become a believer in God at this moment? Well, obviously not. Because, you know, new lessons are hard to learn. And we see problems in chapter 3, and then we'll see big problems in chapter 4. But what's fascinating to me is that God is doing something for Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in this book. And God is doing something for the rest of the Hebrew children in this book. (laughs) But God's also on a path with Nebuchadnezzar too. And God is taking Nebuchadnezzar, he is slowly revealing himself to this pagan, idol-worshiping king and showing himself to this king to the point where it certainly seems that Nebuchadnezzar has a conversion experience later on in the book. God has a plan. Folks, God has a plan. Folks, God has a plan. So stand for the God who has a plan and will work it.